Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to episode 283 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group is a business advisory, information services, and technological firm that helps clients manage risk across four key risk areas. These risk areas include sales and sales channels, including distributors, resellers, and partners, suppliers, customers, and human capital, consisting of employees and contractors. You can check out more information on the Red Flag Group at www.redflaggroup.com. In today's episode, I visit with Dr. Samuel Buell, a professor of law at Duke University. He wrote a very interesting piece in Slate magazine entitled, Prosecuting Wells Fargo Executives Won't Solve Anything. Uh, He basically takes a look at U.S. criminal law and its requirement for intent and then talks about the um, corporate form and corporate structures and why it's so difficult to prove intent at the very highest levels of corporation for actions taken at the operational level. Dr. Bill is uniquely suited to make these observations as he was one of the lead prosecutors in the Enron Task Force, which prosecuted uh, Enron executives for financial fraud in the past decade. I found uh, his thoughts uh, very interesting, very provocative, and we have a very wide-ranging and yet very interesting interview. I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox here again. And today I have with me Professor Samuel Buell. He is a professor of law at Duke Law School, and he wrote an extraordinarily interesting and thought-provoking piece, which appeared in the online publication Slate, entitled Prosecuting Wells Fargo Executives Won't Solve Anything. And he graciously uh, agreed to take some time from his uh, schedule to visit with me about that. So with that somewhat long-winded uh, introduction, uh, Professor Buell, thank you very much for taking the time to visit with me. Thanks, Tom. I'm happy to be with you. So I, I do have to say the, uh, you're ex-U.S. prosecutor and you were involved in the Enron cases. And as uh, my listeners know, I'm located in Houston, so I'm very familiar with that. And it's a large part of the Houston and greater compliance legal landscape, but I think that gives you a really unique perspective into uh, why prosecuting the Wells Fargo's executives criminally won't uh, solve anything. So if you could just maybe walk us through uh, your article and and then we'll maybe spend some time on uh, your last three or four paragraphs, which I thought were the most thought-provoking. Well, Tom, there's really two aspects to that um, point. I mean, one of them, which I think is the less controversial or arguable point is just that the criminal laws that we have generally don't position us very well to prosecute managers in these kinds of cases. I mean, when I say these kinds of cases, I mean um, essentially compliance failure cases, which is what Wells Fargo appears to be. Now, obviously, we're going off of limited information. We don't have a published internal investigation report or anything like that yet. Um, But based on what we've heard so far, it seems like this is not a case, unlike the major accounting fraud, fraud scandals of the early 2000s, say Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, some of the ca- other cases of that era, where you had pretty good evidence at the end of the day that management, the management suite was in on the fraud in an in a explicit way. Um, you know, They had full knowledge. In fact, the fraud was being executed at a very high level, at the, at the level of the company's financial statements, which are managed by the C-suite. Um, and many of these bank cases, and Wells Fargo is a great example, just don't fit that pattern. And when you don't have direct management involvement, I think there is a, you know, apparently Elizabeth Warren said at the Senate hearing yesterday to, to the CEO, you know, you should be in jail. And <laughs> that statement kind of shocked me because she's a law professor and, you know, not a criminal law professor, a bankruptcy law professor, but she should know better. I mean, she should know that there's no crime of compliance failure in U.S. law. We can have a conversation. And by the way, by compliance failure, I mean, you know, uh, incentivizing people at the sales level who then take the pressure and turn it into legal violations um, and not having the knowledge that they're actually doing that and not explicitly encouraging them to break the law. So without that level of mental state at the management level or mens rea, as we say in the criminal law, um, you're not going to be able to prove uh, that they're an accomplice to a fraud or that there's a conspiracy or any of the traditional legal theories that would be available. We can have a conversation about whether there ought to be laws that 
make this kind of thing a crime, but I think that, that that's a very, very controversial point. Um, and one that we'd really have to argue out. It's not controversial that under current law, uh, we don't have traditional criminal law principles don't allow imprisonment of people under these kind of circumstances. So that's, the, I think, the less controversial point about the, the really contrasting a case like Wells Fargo with, with a case like Enron. Um, perhaps the more controversial thing that I say in the essay, because it's speculative, from an empirical standpoint, is I wonder whether uh, the criminal prosecutions in the Enron case and other cases of that era, as important as I think they were in terms of bringing wrongdoers to justice, uh, really achieved a whole lot in terms of deterrence. I mean, you know, we have to really, I think, face up to the fact that we did at one point, not that long ago, have a round of very serious prosecutions with sentences that prior to the Enron era, were unheard of in white-collar crime. I mean, sentences of 10, 15, and 20 years in prison without parole for executives of a major Fortune 100 company was something that was really unprecedented in American law. And one would have thought, and certainly a thought behind doing those cases um, from the government's perspective, was that it would send a, a unmistakably powerful message into the management suites that would fundamentally, in some sense, fundamentally change the calculus of risks and benefits. Um, and, and with everything that's happened, particularly in the banking industry, but not just banking, I mean, you think about Volkswagen and the BP oil spill and other industries, uh, empirically, to me, suggests that that message was not the message that was heard. Um, and I don't know why that is. I don't know whether it's, you know, uh, kind of a psychological bias, you know, this isn't going to happen to me, I'm not going to get in trouble, or is it that managers looked at the Enron era cases and they said, well, don't involve yourself uh, in too much detail in what's going on. That's when you expose yourself to prosecution. You had a uh, really interesting uh, line in the article and, and uh, really struck me and has stuck with me, and I'm going to quote it. And you say, as almost always excuse me, as is almost always true with big corporate scandals, the problem at Wells Fargo was not bad apples, but a diseased orchard. So could you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I think that there is, you know, a well-known, um, to use some academic lingo instead of an apple metaphor um, for the moment, There, there is a well-known phenomenon in psychological research called the fundamental attribution error, which is a tendency that we have as humans to attribute each other's behavior to our individual personality characteristics and not to the systems and conditions in which we function. And I think that fundamental attribution error is very active in the way that, that the public and the media and even professionals think about what's going on in the corporate scandals of these this era. We, we tend to look at them and say, well, the problem with that company was that they had bad guys. Um, and and, you know, if we, we just need to punish those bad guys and get them out, and then the next company we don't have to worry about because either they won't have bad guys or the bad guys will be too scared by the punishment in the last case to break the law. And, you know, at this point we have to sort of wonder whether we're kind of banging our heads against a brick wall with that, that thinking because we get scandal after scandal. And I think the Wells Fargo example is a fantastic example for what I'm saying because does anybody really think that, you know, over 5,000 people in that bank were just happened to be, you know, sort of venal criminal types. And, you know, that Wells Fargo went out and recruited all the morally bad people to work at the bank. Uh, you know, these were huge numbers of ordinary line level workers. The conditions under which they were working apparently caused them to break the law. It's actually quite stunning. And, and it, 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 I think, gives us an example of how powerful. And that's what I mean by the diseased orchard, is that, you know, how powerful the incentives and conditions and culture can be inside a company in terms of determining whether that company follows the law or it doesn't follow the law. And again, those conditions are absolutely the, responsible of ma the responsibility of management. Um, I just don't think that the criminal law is in a position to really um, do a whole lot about that, at least as it's currently written. I think we have to have some kind of a different conversation about how we change the rules of the road for managing large corporations, or we change the, the, the rules of the road 
really is even a, as fundamental a level as how large a corporation can be, because it's it's not you know one thing that's interesting to find out as we learn more about Wells Fargo is whether given the size of the bank, the CEO and people at that level would ever have even been in a position to be able to control what was going on at the level of these consumer accounts. The um, in the FCPA world, we had an enforcement action this summer where the corporate office was unable to uh, detect the bribery scandal going on in a China subsidiary because uh, even with their own internal audit, because they found the payment structure was so complex that even the corporate office couldn't understand it. And one of the thoughts I had based on that case was that if a subsidiary's uh, financials are so complex, the corporate office can't understand them, uh, there's a problem at the corporate office. And the point you raise about the, the size of corporations, are they too large to manage? We've, we've seen that with other banks. The, uh, the London Whale case with J.P. Morgan uh, has really raised some, some interesting uh, and perhaps even troubling questions about can we manage these organizations or, or are they so big? Uh, I heard a, a podcast this morning on Bloomberg uh, News uh, about the Senate testimony yesterday of the Wells Fargo CEO, and they brought up Glass-Steagall. And uh, I don't see really Glass-Steagall as an answer uh, to this issue uh, because it wasn't the investment bank versus the uh, consumer or the commercial bank. But the point you raise about the size of corporations, how do we begin to have that discussion, Professor? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i not sure, and that's, you know, I've just recently written a book about corporate crime that's an effort to really define and explain the problem as, as along the lines of this piece we've been talking about. Um, and the book really just ends with some speculation about kind of what the next conversation or next book needs to take on. And and this is, you know, this is the topic. I mean, I just looking at it from a 10,000-foot perspective, uh, I tend to think, well, are we at a moment? I mean, are we at a, a moment that's in some ways very different from but structurally similar to where we were at the turn of the 20th century when we first had our big, you know, our big uh, first encounter with the large corporation and not being able to control its activities, which were producing all kinds of uh, harms for society, um, harms to the environment, harms to workers, harms to equality in the economy. And, you know, what did we get? We got antitrust law. Um, and, it, and, and related laws, the Sherman Act, of course, being the most famous one, but a suite of laws that were our first big legislative program to try to rein in this corporate behemoth, and, and they were very effective. Now, different times cause, call for different solutions, but I wonder if we're, we're at that kind of a moment. And, you know, one, one thing that I heard recently that, um, that uh, <clears throat> I think it might have been one of my students or somebody mentioned to me, which I thought was really an indicator of sort of, wow, if that's where we are, we've got a problem. Um, they said, well, w you know, we've got all these big corporations. We have these compliance problems and these scandals keep arising. Well, what about some of this new machine learning technology? Maybe there's a way that that could be somehow harnessed for compliance in these banks. And, and you know, that was a little bit scary to me because um, I thought, well, gee, on the one hand, I thought, gee, I bet that is in some sense uh, one direction that we're going in. But on the other hand, I mean, what could be more of a confession that these companies are out of the control of management than the idea that, well, we can't do it, but maybe we can get computers to do it for us? Well, I think um, actually perhaps it's not quite that scary because it could be simply that by using uh, the information generated, huge amounts of information generated and running it through some type of transaction monitoring program, it could uh, identify issues that uh, lawyers or other professionals might need to more fully investigate red flags, I think we would call them. So, you know, perhaps we're we can use one of those technologies to help. But with the, the current structure of corporate corporate management, and, and I have to admit, I have not read your book, which is entitled Capital Offenses, Business Crime and Punishment in America's Corporate Age. But from my recall of corporate law in, in law school, corporations were initially set up to create uh, diffuse liability. That was one reason. And also to allow uh, decision makers, uh, 
decisions to be made by a wider variety of owners and uh, professional managers. So that has been with us for three or 400 years now. And the problems that we see with Wells Fargo may go to some of those structures that were created long ago when um, Englishmen were sitting around in coffee shops uh, near Lloyd's uh, wondering about their ships that they had uh, sent on uh, uh, training expeditions across the globe. I think we're on the same page there, Tom. And if you do read my book, you'll see me talk in the last chapter about about that basic idea of of you know the corporation being intentionally designed as a responsibility reducing device. <laughs> that was its point, and it was a brilliant idea, um, a legal technology that uh, had a major role in producing the wealthiest society that's ever existed on this planet. But uh, but yes, at the time the idea was invented, society and technology were at a scale that was just completely different from where we are now. And so maybe we do need to go back and rethink some of those first principles of the corporate structure. I think one thing that's interesting, as we've seen in some contexts, and I don't know whether this resonates with the work that you do, but we've seen you know, some differences between publicly held and privately held corporations in terms of... Um, how much skin in the game there is and how that affects incentives. There's an interesting new paper out um, by Jennifer Arlen and Marcel Kahn at NYU about the DOJ's uh, prosecution guidelines and corporate settlements and the use of monitors and the you know um, creation of compliance programs within settlements. And one of the things they argue in this piece about DOJ's practices is that, uh, and I'm not sure I agree with them, but it's an interesting point, is that DOJ should, you know, they worry about the problem of prosecutors getting involved in in running compliance, which is not their expertise. And they say, uh, maybe uh, we we should not, in, in the settlements, insist on monitors and compliance in cases of closely held corporations, because in those cases, the managers have the sufficient incentive to, in theory, run good compliance, because it's their money, not the shareholders' money that's on the line. So I thought that was an interesting point. And again, I've seen that you know in a number of different contexts. And you, you think about the contrast between the banks as they existed when they were partnerships and then what happened to them when they became publicly held companies and, and so on. And you begin to think, well, maybe that separation of the famous separation of ownership and control is something we need to look at again. You know, that, that's a great point as well, because when we saw the uh, privately held in the uh, partnerships that were many, that, that were the business and organizational structure of many of those companies in the 1990s moved to public companies, we saw their risk appetite greatly increase, um, basically because uh, the former partners were no longer the owners. They were just shareholders now. And the uh, risk, I thought, it diffused the risk at that level. So that's a really interesting point as well. You know, Professor, you mentioned risk. I think that's that's just a really important um, concept here as well. I mean, the corporation is one thing, but also the conception of how we deal with risk, what risk means, and what responsibilities are with regard to risk. Very, very difficult here because risk is the problem, right? Uh, and in criminal law, is not unfamiliar with the concept of risk. You know, we criminalize overly risky driving and other kinds of overly risky behavior. That's manslaughter law. But the trouble with corporations is they're supposed to take risk. And so it becomes, very, you know, that's their business. Um, and so that's how they generate money, especially in the financial services industry. It's very hard to draw the line between good risk and bad risk. And, you know, this then, to get back to the Wells Fargo example, connects to the, the problem of compensation. I mean, so how do you motivate people to take the right kinds of risks with compensation? Um, and not get what we seem to get over and over again, especially in the banking industry, which is compensation motivations that lead to criminal violations. Yeah, that's a really um, uh, interesting point, and you raised that uh, also in your article, so I was uh, very intrigued by that as well. Unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but uh, I, for one, greatly would uh, hope we can continue this conversation. The Wells Fargo case is front and center in the compliance world right now, uh, and I think it's going to provide lots of lessons for practitioners, for law professors, for compliance professionals, and commentators like me. So I hope that uh, we can continue the conversation, and I hope you'll keep writing for Slate. <laughs>
Thanks, Tom. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I have two calls to action for you. Uh, The first is if you listen to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would uh, rate our podcast. It would certainly help us in our rankings. The second thing is if you have any questions that uh, you have long wanted answered, I'm developing my next mailbag episode. So uh, why don't you send them to me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you again for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report.